when Abraham Lincoln declared in 1863 that the backer of the Gettysburg must ensure that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth, he was not merely being aspirational. On the onset of the Civil War, the United States of America had one of the biggest higher rates of suffrage in the world. The question is not whether Lincoln truly meant government of the people, but what our country has throughout its history taken the political term people to actually mean. In 1863, it did not mean your mother or your grandmother. It did not mean you and me. That is according to Tanya Hisi on his book, Between the World and Me, as he interrogates the meaning, the government by the people, for the people, and who actually is the people when it comes to government. My name is Isasi Pingosim Dingi, and I am your host here at the Young Researchers Hub, where science and the public become one. Today, we are here again, meeting after a great session we had um, a week, uh, two weeks ago on theoretical framework. And today, we are here with Ms. Asi Pim Kalisa, evaluating the, democrat the democratization uh, evaluating the influence of electronical violence on democratic consolidation in sub-Saharan Africa, the case of Democratic Republic of Congo from 2006 to 2018. Today we're interrogating the whole concept of democracy, violence, elections, and government by the people, for the people, and what that truly means when we look at the influence of electrical violence. Ms. Mkalisa is currently doing her PhD in higher education with Health at Rhodes University. She is also working as a research assistant at the Center for Women and Gender that is in Nelson Mandela University. She is also a postgraduate administrator at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Nelson Mandela University. Her master's political science research thesis obtained at Nelson Mandela University looked at evaluating the influence of electrical violence on democratic, democratic consolidation in sub-Saharan Africa, the case of the Democratic Republic of Congo from 2006 to 2008. She is currently serving as a founder and executive director of UCO's Youth Development Program and director of publications at Evoke Research Primary Cooperative. She is a social activist gender activist and, as a, and a mother. Asite, thank you very much for taking your time and thank you for entrusting us with your research and being here with us today. Welcome to the Young Researchers Hub where science and the public become one. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, so today we are here asking you to take us through your research. And you touch on something. Um, and when when Saneli Kaya told me um, that we're having you in August, which is what's said to actually be the month where we're having local government election, if I recall correctly. And I was like, oh, okay. And we're evaluating <laughs> the influence of violence when it comes to um, the electrical violence, uh, influence of electrical violence. And you, you, you look at a country that is in distress, um, Democratic Republic of Congo is, um, it's a sad state. Um, I know many countries are at war. I know many countries have been at war when it comes to um, elections, but the case of the Democratic Republic of Congo is, um, is one that um, one cannot fight from what is going on there. Um, I mean, since back in 1960s, they've been on a battle for democracy and, and, the, and the implementation of what democracy is. But today, I am not the one who's on the podium. You are. And please take us through your introduction and the background of your research. Um, we want to hear why this, this topic, why are you looking at this particularly? OK, um, thank you so much, Issa. And uh, hello to everyone who's watching today. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so uh, my study, which was my master's research at dissertation, um, was centered around the broader theme of democracy, constitutionalism, and electoral violence in Africa. Uh, it was fitting to do, as I started doing it in 2018, uh, during the time where the DRC had an alarming outbreak of political instability due to elections being constantly postponed um, since 2016. So the title of my, stu my study, as explained, is Evaluating the Influence of Electoral Violence on Democratic Consolidation in Sub-Saharan Africa, with the specific focus of the case of the DRC from 2006 to 2018. Uh, the historical context of African states is very broad, and it dates back to many, many, many decades of colonialism. Just as a disclaimer, um, Issa, the one I'll be explaining today due to purposes of time is to give context to the understanding of this research. Right. So in yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, democratic development and political violence is an extensively researched as a topic. Um, it is important to note that uh, the examination of democratization in Africa by researchers governmental uh, people and non-governmental organizations is present extensively throughout sub-Saharan Africa. However, in the literature of democratization and African politics, electoral violence as a subcategory of political violence has not received vast research, especially in sub-Saharan African states. So the study of democratization and electoral violence is key in revealing the result of a complex interplay between democratization and the patronage-based system of big man politics. So the destruction of indigenous cultural traditions, the dislocation of African economy, and the enforcement of oppressive laws in the African continent began from what was referred to as the scramble of Africa in 1880s. So the history of African states after the Berlin Conference, which was held in the 1880s, has since been blighted by authoritarianism, political persecution, and crimes against humanity. So Congolese people were not exempted in those crimes against humanity and political persecution. They struggled for human dignity and justice during colonialism. So African people advanced independence ideologies and nationalist movements to free themselves from colonialism. Such pro-independence movements led to 17 sub-Saharan um, African states gaining their independence in the 1960s. So now the transition from colonialism to nationalism in many African states developed with many prospects. Nationalism had to ensure that the government the government, sorry, accrued rapid economic growth to eradicate colonial legacies. So the colonial rule during the colonial period affected the resources and institutional settings for, for subsequent economic development in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, many would ask Issa or think, why drag the whole historical context? Well, this is to dismantle the belief that big men politics in Africa are a result of power hungry African leaders only, but to show many dynamics that has led to such political behavior in the African state with different background when it comes to colonialism for different African countries. So the DRC received its independence in 1960 with a ruling coalition of national parties and Joseph Kasavumbu became the first black president in the DRC with Patrice Emery Lumumba serving as the first elected Congo prime minister. While countries like Nigeria, for example, developed pro-democracy pro movements in the 1990s, the DRC was ungovernable due to ethnic clashes with limited development and power being taken through coup d'etats. So this was under the leadership of Laurent Kabila. So the DRC was not only the sub-Saharan African state to face a crisis of leadership or coup d'etat during independence, but many sub-Saharan African states have had political clashes due to leadership crisis. So a historical turning point, which is very important for the study for the DRC in its post-independence, 
was then marked by the assassination of Laurent Kabila in 2001. This historical turning point led to his son, Joseph Kabila, taking over as the president of the DRC. Electoral democracy was then deemed necessary to prevent state collapse and political instabilities in the DRC. So the Democratic Republic of Congo then began with a democratic transition process, which was completed in 2006, where my case study begins. Um, and, 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 and that means from 2001 to 2006, that was the period of the post-colonial democratic experience for the DRC. Uh, 2006 was also the year when multi-party elections were first held in the DRC after the first and the second Congo wars, which served, as, which served in this research as a key historical component. So Joseph Kabila ran for his first elected term, whilst Jean Pierre Pemba ran as the main opposition candidate. So the 2006 elections heralded a formal end to the democratic transition period, which facilitated the introduction of a democratically elected president and his patronage network over the national um, institutions. However, um, it is important to note that the DRC experienced a very long transition to democracy, unlike some of African states, with continuous reversals back to autocratic rule. So the research then focused on the ruling of Joseph Kabila, who is the son of Laurent Kabila, from 2006 to 2018 slash 2019. Thank you. Um, thank you, Asifa, for that. Um, it's it, it's quite a, a, a lot to get through um, because you, you look at this and um, as I was reading your paper, uh, which is one of the questions I'll ask later on was the, the, the role of the court all of this, the role of different institutions. Um, but as you speak also, you, you mentioned the issue of um, tribal clashes. That has been a big issue, um, again, post-independence. You, you look at Rwanda, you look at Nigeria. Um, I, you have had some of that in South Africa. It, it, it mm -hmm. seems to be a trend that after every independence, you look at Zimbabwe is another case. After independence, we, we begin to have different problems of um, tribalism, um, uh, clashes, which is again stagnate uh, our progress um, in trying to implement what is democracy um, and what it would look like. And many people argue on different terms, again, questioning the whole thing, governance by the people, for the people, and who's, who's that. Um, especially around the issue of now tribes are clashing. So it means there is someone who is the governance in, in a certain tribe and there's one who's not. And I would like to understand the objectives behind um, taking this research. Um, what was the, the influence? Um, and, and later on, uh, I would like you to take us through your, your research methodology and specifically why you chose that and the theoretical framework coupled with, with it because that will also help us understand, um, because the idea of also young researchers hub is helping people choose their methodology, their research, and how they formulate their research questions and objectives. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll first start with uh, explaining uh, my research objectives and then hand over to you and then um, go back to the research methodology and theoretical framing. Um, so the main aim, of my study was to identify the factors that promotes the existence and growth of electoral violence in the DRC, to find the factors that contributes to the fueling of electoral violence in the DRC. The study then aimed at evaluating the critical role of weak democratic institutions in promoting democratic consolidation. I think you mentioned some of the institutions which in essence are supposed to stand independently, but have influence when it comes to uh, something that you'll understand later on, which is patron clientelism. Even though elections are not the only sign of democracy in a state, this study seeks to provide evidence of how the hope 
of a better free um, 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 country is squandered due to executive elitism. You mentioned something earlier when you were saying government for the people, by the people. But now um, um, this research is trying to show that um, even though we put the government in, in spaces, the patron client relations, the feedback that we receive has squandered um, due to executive elitism. So this study thus contributed into the existing knowledge on electoral violence in Africa by demonstrating a deeper understanding on how the citizens and the government respond to political encounters of the state. The study then evaluated the DRC's political climate, as well as the role played by patrimonial politics in the wake of expanding electoral violence. So the specific research objectives are stemming from the broad aims where one, to evaluate the components that trigger the, the escalation of electoral violence in sub-Saharan African states, in particular, the DRC as a case study. The second objective was to examine the influence of predatory and rent-seeking leadership towards electoral manipulation through the understanding of the role played by patron client relations on democratic institutions. And then the last objective was to identify the neo-patrimonialism effect on social and economic factors in the DRC, leading to electoral violence. Um, Issa, I'm not sure if I should continue with uh, the theoretical framing, but I'm just gonna hand back to you. Yes, you, you, you can continue um, with the theoretical and the methodology. Okay, now it is important that um, there's a shift when it comes to borrowing from uh, a, a theoretical framework or coming up with a conceptual framing. So in this particular study, you'll understand why um, I had to borrow from this particular a theoretical framing as well as the choice of the research methodology that I have chosen. Now the research me methodology um, was also um, particularly important as in any other research to answer the problem statement that was stated for this research in order to ensure um, that uh, my research objectives are being, are being answered. So as the study seek to evaluate electoral violence, which continued to impact democratic consolidation in sub-Saharan African states, in particular, the DRC, to gather research on electoral violence and its impact. A case study with a qualitative methodology was deployed. This method helped in examining and understanding of electoral violence and its causes. The study has utilized a critical discourse analysis lens by filtering the case through the Hogland analytical framework. So that was my theoretical framework for electoral violence in conflict-ridden societies. This framework was used to examine the DRC's 2006, 2011, and 2018 19 elections. So the election periods were chosen because they signified the democratic ruling and civilian involvement in elections after a long dictatorship in the DRC. The study reviewed a vast amount of literature on the subject of study using published and unpublished documents and, 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 and as well as the study utilized internal data within organizations um, through reports and analysis. The most contributing information for the study was also found in libraries such as journals, newspapers, directories, clippings, international organizations, the reports, uh, government statistics, the reports on elections by electoral institutions, books on democracy and electoral violence in South Africa, as well as books on constitutionalism and patron clientelism. So this was in essence a desktop analysis with a lot of reading required. Now I remember Issa being asked by, um, by uh, an internal reviewer during my proposal stage why this is a desktop analysis. Remember I mentioned when I, when I started speaking that at the time when I was undertaking this research, the DRC was already a conflict-ridden society and also access to resources for young researchers is an issue. 
So the mm. barrier, we, we were not aware of online, we were aware of online platforms, but there had to be new introductions of policies on how to actually do interviews using online platforms such as Zoom, Teams, um, Skype, and so on and so forth. So um, for me to do primary research at that time, I was required to go to the DRC and understanding that I am from a, a foreign land as it is deemed, and also a woman it was unsafe for me to go there. So those were some of the limitations. And a desktop analysis was the one that will give me a historical context that I need in order to answer some of the critical questions which will feed back into my um, um, research objectives. So it was also, um, it is also important that um, this research used a lot of information from foreign observer missions. As you all know that there are foreign observers um, that are deployed by the West in order to come and monitor elections in the African state or monitor democracy in itself as a system. So why the choice of Hawkland framework? Well, when uh, evaluating electoral violence and the triggers of political violence, the nature of politics and the nature of elections, as well as electoral institutions must be examined. So these institutions are inclusive of political parties in a state, which plays a vital role in the electoral process. So the nature of politics, the electoral process, as well as the electoral institutions are strongly emphasized as factors that are involved during elections according to Hogland's framework. So Hogland's framework studies electoral violence in broader terms when it comes to the African state. So I am using this, I used this analytical framework in order to study electoral violence in the DRC, remember? 2006, 2011, 2008 elections. So when evaluating electoral violence, it was also important to take note of patrimonial systems that encourage electoral violence because such systems marginalize a significant portion of the society. As now we see that we do not have government for the people, by the people because the people are marginalized by these systems, which are called patrimonial systems. So when patron systems define this, the nature of politics, which is situated in Hawkland's framework in the state, the promotion of corruption and neglect of the rule of law, the constitution now becomes evident. So vast literature on a Hogland's framework was found through articles and books written by Hogland and other colleagues such as Fidel J um, with work that is dated from the early 2000s, 2009, many articles where the framework of Hogland's is being used, the 2004, 2016. And there's also for someone who, who would like to go and read more on the theoretical framework, there's also uh, a current uh, literature or articles that are being written by Christian Hogland um, from 2020. The last art article I saw um, is one from 2020, I think. Um, thank you very much, Asite. Um, as we were talking, um, both me and Ukazi, we literally had the same thing in mind. Um, I'm just going to read her, her comment, although it's not the comment time. Thank you for bringing the challenges with doing primary research as a woman in an extremely violent and masculine country. The DRC at the time had multiple rebel groups, militarized groupings, and that traditionally takes form in a hetero masculine way. And I, I was thinking just how, even in such settings as acad in, in academia, you're still confined in doing your research as a woman by this oppression. You literally, I'm thinking like, okay, I, I'm trying to, 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 to assist society to move forward, but I have to think of many other things First, safety of myself and my own protection, my vulnerabilities, and the limitation that has in trying to get the study across. Um, that was such a, I don't know, how, how did that come across to me? I think I'm going to sit down and reflect on it once I'm done, um, because it, it, it takes a different turn in trying to think about 
the, the areas we want to research on as women. Because I think another interesting state that will uh, to research will be South Sudan and the uprise of women amidst the conflict when it comes to election and everything. You'll remember the, war, uh, the young lady who became the face. And mm -hmm. if I were to go and want to research about that in South Sudan and what would that mean for me as a woman, mm -hmm. uh, although it would be different if it was a man, so it means most of the time men will have it easier. So it means some things will still be seen from their lens um, because of the landscape. And thank you for bringing that about um, the research challenges that we still need to address. Um, as women, but um, I have a follow-up question. As you um, um, go through your 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 theoretical framework, um, I, I I don't know the nationality of the person who does the, the research, um, but I wanted to understand, uh, or rather, what are some of the limitations um, you came across because of this particular um, theoretical framework? And the reason I'm asking that is because most of the time. Um, different people that I've encountered was that when it comes to research was that the, the theoretical frameworks were not fitting for the African context. Um, was the, was the, did you encounter the same limitation and how did you work around those limitations if you had encountered them? Okay, um, you've said a lot of um, interesting things um, that I would like to um, respond to, but due to time, I think it is yes, worth mentioning because I think it is worth mentioning because um, these things are also found in my analysis and findings. Uh, the voices of women in elections and um, the voices of um, women in the uh, constitutional settings or institutions in the DRC, as well as the things that women go through during electoral violence were shocking. Um, firstly, in the DRC, um, 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 at least in South Africa, we've moved into the gender culture of having um, 50, 40% of women in, in, in democratic or governmental spaces. In the DRC, that is still an issue that they're battling with. One, two, um, the, 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 the runner ups from 2006 up until 2018, a few, if there were any women that were actually encouraged to run for presidency. The third one, which was very painful, is that there is, uh, that there is no literature that is available which speaks into um, women's experiences during electoral violence. And, 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 and we've seen that in so many African states, um, 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 sexual assault is a weapon during a political unrest where there's attacks that, um, um, that affect vastly women and children in, this, in, in these countries. But there hasn't been literature or rather studies, or even news outlets that covers such issues that women and children face. But coming into um, the, the theoretical framing, I, I agree, Issa, that um, sometimes we do come across uh, uh, theories that are Western in na nature and that do not speak to the context of the difference that the African con uh, continent found itself after colonialism. Also taking into consideration that we are in a state where the education system in itself is a borrowed system that we need to continue borrow from. So when it comes to the theoretical um, 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 framework that I've chosen, lucky enough, uh, Christine um, has been writing on the African context, constitutionalism, sub-Saharan Africa, and that is how um, um, uh, she was able to come up with this theoretical framing. So for me, the theoretical framework was not a leading aspect into answering the key issues that I was trying to research, but the historical context of the DRC and where it found itself in during the 1880s, 1960s, up until the democratic transition has assisted with the analysis of the theoretical framework. With, the, with that being said, the Hawkland's theoretical framework in, in articles was silencing in a way um, the history of the African continent, continent, especially the history of sub-Saharan African states.
And um, 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 even when you attend conferences where they discuss um, African democracy and constitutionalism, the silence of the colonial um, origins of such systems that are continuing to suppress or oppress the Black nation is very loud in itself. So it was very important in this research to have an entire 20 page where I explain the historical context, even in analysis where I remind the reader that this history should not be forgotten. Even though mm. African leaders have themselves taken power in its highest nature, I'm with critics saying that their power hunger is developed due to the processes of democracy only, but it comes from the early ages. Even in this research, something that is key, um, which I'll end off with in this in this context, is that there is um, there is a negative research aspect on one party states when it comes to the historical context of. African states. And it, it was important for me to explain the theory of nationalism and what was happening in, in the DRC and other African states when there was um, a, a socialist state as a system. So as to understand that for in as much as we find ourselves in a democratic state, the 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 the, the, the one party state, as some may term it, was also in a term of a radical movement or a radical system when it comes to the oppression of colonialism. And of course, it was not perfect in its, in its nature, just as democracy is not perfect in its nature as a system. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, we, we had to learn a, a lot of things. Um, I've noticed Nobugele's question and Gazi's question. Um, I'll ask questions once we get done with the presentation. You, you mentioned something about African leaders and when they take transition. Somewhere in the books I've read um, or articles, um, someone had once mentioned, was talking about the era of um, Kwame Nkwore, of how African leaders take power without any economic background, without any scientific background, um the only thing mostly they have is the political background and running a state uh, requires more and they go back to ask assistance from the very people who oppress us um they go and borrow uh, systems and they go and borrow theories from the very same people who oppress us um which is a debate for a whole another day of how we still find ourselves trapped in this system we try to move, we realize just how deep we are trapped into this. And um, I would like you to take us then through to your findings of your research. And um, I'll give you the chance to do your findings and your recommendations. And then we can then do a whole conversation around questions and answers. Thank you. OK. So um, just a side note, I think it's <laughs> 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 Your questions and follow-up comments are just spiking some a, a lot of thinking in my head. But um, I think we all know by now that the colonial system, as well as the colonial government, was a very strategic move when it comes to the control of the African continent by the West. Even the assistance or the support of democratization by the West post-Cold War was a strategic move. So now, even though we speak about Africanizing um, 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 our, our countries, or Africanizing um, our systems in a way that caters for our people without going to borrow in the inter international institutions, it is more or it is more or less a something that cannot be that cannot be done um, in a quickest form because there are so many mm. things that we still need to unpack, so many colonial legacies that we were left with, with many research that doesn't touch on those things, but rather blame it on the African leaders. But as you said, it's a, it's a debate or discussion for another day. Um, so my key findings from the data that I analyzed were one, the research analyzed showed that historical, ethnic, economic, and institutional cleavages play a major role in the democratic development of the DRC. The other finding was that the research that um, social inequality and political exclusion 
affected the democratic stability of the DRC. So social inequality in the DRC manifests itself through tribalism and patrimonialism. So these two things are different, tribalism and patrimonialism. Inequality of ethnic power in the DRC has resulted in political violence, which has now been a continuous thing for decades for African, um, for African states. Um, in sub-Saharan states, the ethnic factor and economic stability dream by political leaders remains the leading factor when it comes to the voting polls. So when African leaders or African part, political parties go to manifest, they manifest through ethnic lines because of ethnic powers that their societies have. And also those ethnic divisions were they pre-colonial, but they were mostly supported by the colonial state in order to gain power and trust from the powerful ethnic groups. Another key finding was that there was a violence of voting, which resulted in fear of voting for the Congolese people. So the violence of voting violated the right to political participation for the Congolese people. The electoral violence that permitted through the DRC from 2006, 2011 and 2018 presidential elections led to a drop of electoral turnout from 71% in 2006, when a democratic elections were introduced to 47.56% in 2018. Now the fear of voting as a research finding signified that the violations of human rights in the DRC during election were not only due to the brutal killings and coercive beatings from the military, but also led to the fear of exercising one's political rights. So young people, and, and as well as women, stayed at home rather than going to the polls. But it is also important to note that there was a health issue, especially during 2018, which was the outbreak of Ebola, which led to many communities not participating during elections. So these findings of the fear of voting were also compatible with Hogland's study or criteria on the nature of politics and elections. The voters' response to the electoral violence taking place in the DRC in 2018 was by staying away from the voting polls. There was also intimidation for voters with violence and mobilizing that has led to clientelism, as I explained um, earlier on, where the mobilization would happen through ethnic lines and um, spiking violence in many areas, especially in the Eastern part of, of the TRC. The other finding which is very important is the crisis of governance in the TRC, especially from 2011 onwards where the country was faced with legitimacy issues, crisis of with political systems and unaccountable democratic institutions. Remember democracy um, was introduced in Africa as a beacon of hope in order to, and to, to, to deal with the colonial legacies. So in the research, the analysis of unaccountable procedures in electoral systems is evident from 2006, 2011, and 2018 elections. And it showed that despite having multi-party elections, the political regime in the DRC still has authoritarian traits, which moves us into the debate of the hybrid nature of democratic systems in Africa and also in, in, in Western states, because the current debate only focuses on the hybrid nature of, of African states and how African states have got authoritarianism, forgetting that all other democratic states around the world now have systems of authoritarianism, including America itself. So the state of governance in the revealed through elections was neither fully authoritarian nor fully democratic, but was rather a hybrid regime. The funding, um, 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 the other finding also revealed that authoritarianism was strongly upheld, especially when it comes to the marginalization and repression of opposition figures by the Joseph Kabila regime. 
So the opposition, opposition members are reflected in 2006, 2011, and 2018 elections show fragmentation and the weak capacity to challenge the ruling party in parliament. There were many other um, opponents which had to flee the country during the electoral campaigning because they feared for their lives. So they went to exile up until it was time for elections, giving them a small amount of time in order to mobilize for votes. Another key finding was the inability of the judicial system and the media to remain independent. This did not just take place in 2018 elections, but research has shown that the regime has sought to undermine the independence of the media as well as the judiciary since 2006. So the judiciary of the DRC has a central role to play in providing appropriate enforcement mechanisms for constitutionalism. The powerful networks, along with ethnic domination, still held power over the judiciary decisions and what the media could portray, thus violating the constitution of the DRC. And thus, what I've said earlier, which is less uh, media coverage when it comes to the issues that women and children face during electoral violence. Also, it was evident from the research analyzed that neo-patrimonialism remained the key driver of politics with the two powerful networks of the ethnic Kandagis as well as the Bajamulenge Rwandis exist. So such cleavages have affected the socioeconomic development of the broader population in the DRC, big men politics and elitism. The other finding was that socioeconomic development is not the only prompt um, um, for democratic sustainability, but also for the persistence of conflict in the DRC. So these ethnic div divisions in the DRC do not only become manifested through elections, but also are as a result from historic ethnic tensions. What I was saying before that, before colonialism was introduced, there were ethnic tensions, but they were alleviated through the policies and the systems which supported the powerful ethnic groups in order to gain their support to run Col um, colonialism in, in, in African states. For as much as the research showed that we were likely to vote according to ethnic relations, there was also evidence that Congolese people had lost confidence even in the democratic voting system, system in itself, meaning they've lost confidence in the democratic system in itself. So this was also reflected through the voter turnout, even though the voter turnout had many dynamics, including the fear of voting. The research also showed the links between clientelism and the significance of civil societies. Civil societies, which are a very important um, aspect when it comes to elections in a country, in holding the government accountable. There is no doubt that civil society's political awareness in the DRC has grown since independence, but the ability of civil society organizations to improve political transparency is threatened by civil society clientelist funding. So the funding of these civil societies, the people who are the face or decision maker, makers in these civil societies becomes a leading factor when it comes to whether electoral violence ends or perpetuates. So despite such clientelism between the state and civil societies, the research has also shown how religious organizations such as the Catholic Church played a significant role in countering corruption in the DRC. So the Catholic Church um, is the strongest actor in the civil society organizations in the DRC and many other African states, and it has been a prominent opposition to Kabila's administration. So the Catholic Church during the 2008 pre-election violence condemned the use of Congolese personnel to violate human rights rather than protect the state. Also, what is important to note from the research again is the politicization and corruption surrounding natural resource governance. So the DRC has a potential for having productive, lucrative mining and forestry sectors, which could transform the state's economic stability. However, due to corruption, 
inadequate institutional capacity and governance defines there are deficiencies, sorry, there are poor economic growth indicators of such sectors. On the other hand, the research showed that social capital remained a big challenge in the DRC. This is partly due to the issue of citizenship and identity of Rwandan or Burundi's heritage. There is a need to reverse the deeply held political narratives of belonging and exclusion in the DRC, which remains a pointed area for political manipulation and suppression. So identity politics in the DRC has greatly affected the legitimacy of elections as the Rwandan and the Burundi's ethnic group have been denied citizenship rights, thus are unable to vote. So furthermore, the ethnic divisions have also led to the challenges in reformation of social capital due to the decline of economic, political, and social infrastructure, which has resulted in distrust. Now, quickly moving on, I see um, we are pressed with time on recommendations. I'm just uh, two minutes, three minutes. So to realize democratic consolidation in sub-Saharan African states like the DRC, there must be broad research and solutions to be implemented on how fear of voting impacts political knowledge in sub-Saharan African democracies. So public participation in democracy is crucial to ensure the enhancement and accountability of the system of governance in a country. Going back to what you were saying is a government for the people and by the people serving the people. So the public holds the legitimacy of the system of governance. And if fear of voting persists in sub-Saharan countries like the DRC, then full democracy, if there's anything like that, will remain unachievable. Again, a responsive governance is necessary to maintain a stable power relations between the state and the citizens. And for such, the legitimate political compacts can be created. So the possible areas for recommendation or investigation is the investigation of the electoral law reforms in the DRC. The reform committee must be implemented to investigate the insights into the role of the electoral management bodies and how such bodies should work on the reinforced approaches to deepen consolidate and institutionalize democracy. There's a huge chunk um, 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 or part in my research that analyzes the electoral the electoral um, law as well as the electoral management bodies and as institutions that are supposed to be a high response to free and fair elections. So the postponed elections in 2018 to 2019 in many African states such as Libya, Algeria, South Sudan is in Tunisia showed the inability of the government in those states to ensure processes supported by the true separation of powers, effective check and balances, an independent judiciary, a free press, and a robust and politically active civil society. So that is some of the things that African um, um, countries need in order to deal with the issue of um, manipulated elections, debates around elections being unfair, as well as electoral violence. So sub-Saharan African democracy operate with political, social, and economic development traje trajectories that are all tied to election results that usually create a zero-sum game. One avenue for investigation and reform in the DRC would be looking at the impact of the zero-sum game that elections pose in African governance and constitutionalism. The zero-sum game possesses a huge threat to the effectiveness of democratic institutions, which are to ensure accountability and transparency of the government. So representation, um, representation conflict can occur when elections are organized as a zero-sum uh, zero game, which means that um, the election um, losers are left out of participation in government and governance. So zero-sum game simply means the election losers, those who have lost in the elections, unlike in South Africa where they gain seats in parliament according to their numbers. In the DRC, those who have lost during elections are left out of participation in government and governance.
So free and fair elections in of themselves are not the solution for political, economic, and social project, progenies. So if the zero sum tradition of elections and representation is not given much attention in terms of policy reform, then this cycle of hybrid regime formation in Africa will expand with limited focus on the human element when it comes to policies. And the human element is very important when it comes to democracy. Moreover, the DRC's government together with the international community and civic organizations must work on the electoral violence prevention measures in terms of what works in different sub-Saharan African democracies, because each and every African state, inclusive of sub-Saharan countries, differs when it comes to the trajectories that they've faced during colonialism, their transition to democracy, as well as the term that have been served by different types of political leaders. So the work on electoral violence prevention needs to cut across the resolutions that needs to be put in place to deal with various histories of ethnic violence in the DRC. Um, okay, although uh, many view the DRC as a state close to failure, due to political violence, the country still has the potential for democratic consolidation or close to democratic consolidation, especially when looking to the ability of the state to provide basic services to the citizens. The barrier for the democratic consolidation potential in the DRC is the lack of leadership demonstration in advancing public good versus private gain. So the DRC's government must commit and act on ensuring the security and prosperity of its citizens. There are great policies and strategies that the DRC government is currently working on together with the international institutions to work on achieving the developmental goals, for example. These strategies include the Congo Consortium and Peace Reconstruction and the USAID Country Development Cooperation Strategy. So this demonstrates the positive take the DRC government could take and is ready to take through the investment of more strategies that can be crafted to manage conflict and enhance a socioeconomic uh, development. There is, um, there is, uh, there is a research, okay, there is um, a, a, a research recommendation that focuses on women that I want to go to um, as, as I end off. So there must be research, or there is a research, uh, uh, okay, while doing this research was, um, there was limited exploration of how violence against women escalated during elections in sub-Saharan African states. Anti-gender-based violence institutional research needs to be revamped in order to address the practice of violence against women in election periods, which includes the type of tactics used that violate women during elections in sub-Saharan African states. There must be options um, present for policy and programming responses to protect women and children during political violence in sub-Saharan African states. These policies and institutions must be positioned to prevent and mitigate violence against women in elections. And these institutions, including the ones that already exist, must be interrogated. These institutions are inclusive of, sorry, are inclusive of um, international organizations such as the UNDP, UN women and those are running the programming to support um, electoral assistance and women's participation in elections. This perhaps will provide the opportunity for further research on the convergence of electoral violence and gender-based violence. Also, the participation of women in governance must be the key focus for the DRC in order to play its part in gender equality. Um, for purposes of time, I think I'll end there when it comes to uh, the recommendations. Um, thank you very much, Asite. Um, the RC, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, seems to be a mirror of all the challenges that we're facing as an African continent when it comes to the failure of democracy, post-colonialism, um, the effects of colonialism, 
it seems to touch on every country. Because as you're talking, I'm like, hmm, that's happening in South Africa. That's something that we have to get home also. Um, so I think it's one country that we still need to study further. And I think finding solutions for that country, um, we can literally be able to use those solutions to spread out to the continent. Because um, like I said in the beginning, that's where the problem um, is. If we just cut up the clap or in like, yeah, let's go and I call you because um, the country is in serious distress whenever you read about it. Um, but so just before I go on Facebook, to all, we have three questions on Facebook and one on on um, on Zoom. I was just thinking about when when you're talking about the issue of women um, on the end, on how maybe also something that we need to look at now in our context of South Africa, the the role of women beyond numbers. I know we're voting. I know we are getting into power, but in in terms of quality beyond quantity now, in terms of quality, where we are as a country, um, how different we are from women in, in DRC. Because it's one thing, I always say sometimes it's one thing to be given something, but if you're, not, you, uh, if you're given an opportunity to vote, but you're not in giving uh, any effect to change, there's no change influence or while you, you're voting because of many other things like saying fraud, manipulation of elections and all of those things. Um, it's still very much difficult to quantify as something that is progressive. Yes, we're voting, but to what end, to what is it bringing? Some of the questions that we could, ask, we could have. Um, so we have a question from Unobu Bele. Um, Nobile says, hi, Asita, you've explained such a tight collaboration between your theoretical framework and the objectives that you identified. Could you say more about why theoretical frameworks are important and how best to use them in our research? Um, secondly, perhaps an additional question just on the research journey as a whole, Asipe. What does doing research mean to you? I suppose I'm asking because there may be people watching this live not certain what value research can have in their lives to their families and their discipline for advancing society. What can you share about the place of research in your life as a young black academia? Okay, I think, thank you so much Nobu for that question. Um, for me, uh, the theoretical framing, choosing a theoretical framework is um, not necessary to deem the research as uh, powerful enough um, um, to, to end a particular eyesight in the research world. But for me, um, the theoretical framing must be used to borrow from in order to analyze. Since I keep on saying for people who say, no, we can't use theories from the West, you can use them, critique them, create your own conceptual framework write about the issues that you are writing about, but borrow from it because something that we cannot run away from is that as much as in the academic space, the process of decoloniality is being undertaken. It is, all, it is only on engagements. In the structure of how a thesis must be, in a structure of how research must be, these things are still questioned and these things are still marked according to such processes when it comes to marking and how research must be done. Also, I think the structure of research, choosing a theoretical framing, choosing how to do the research has got a broader influence to from who is, um, um, who is um, mentoring you in that process or from which academic discipline are you coming from? So for the politics um, discipline, the theoretical framework has, has always been a standing point. I remember um, in, in my research, I interrogated um, in the literature because I felt like I cannot use a theory that I have been unpaid, its weaknesses and its strengths, and what, am, what, what exactly am I choosing to borrow from that theoretical framework? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I've answered you correctly, but the second question would be, um, um, what research means to me, and especially to the people that are watching. I, I, I had this conversation, I'm gonna move um, a, a bit from the academic terminology and all that. I had this conversation um, with a friend 
And I was saying, you know, it is difficult for me to break down my master's research into a language that everyone can understand. Because the discipline that I'm previously coming from, which is the discipline of politics, these words of patrimonialism, constitutionalism, neo-patrimonialism are words that I'll define in my research, but when I'm speaking in such platforms, there's no time to do that. Right. So I believe there's some research that one does in order to expand themselves as a researcher, we have to be honest, in their field. There is some research that they do to contribute to the knowledge of the field that is meant for a certain audience. But there is research that grounds the researcher in terms of what is their purpose, what do they want to sleep next to for the next five years. And that is why my PhD has moved from my previous master's discipline into the discipline that I'm at. So in the discipline that I'm at, the, re the research that I'm doing speaks at the core of my heart in terms of what is my purpose, what do I see myself doing, which society do I want to impact, and also my contribution to my country in itself in terms of gender equality. So the choice of research, hence we have a lot of researchers noble in, in, in our settings and outside our settings frustrated by their research. It is because when you choose a research topic in 2018, you're choosing something exciting. But when you get into it, even though there's a human element to it, but if you were there to, to, to evaluate policies, documents and all that, all you do is just reading and reading. The human element in it will be absent even by the virtue of you doing secondary data analysis because you're analyzing documents. You didn't build that relationship with your participants. You've taken that information from a secondary source, putting it into text. I know emotionally I would have been speaking differently doing this research if I had a chance to visit the DRC, see firsthand and observe firsthand what the DRC or Congolese people were going through. It was an emotional process because of the history that I was reading, what was happening in the DRC, but not necessarily an emotional aspect that one could have had if they had put the human element to it when it comes to their research methodology. So I think um, one last thing that I can say perhaps to researchers that are currently doing their research field, PhD or masters, your choice of your topic does depend on where you see yourself in terms of your career, but it also depends on the impact that you want to leave, not only in the academic space, but in the communities that we come from. Thank you. Um, sure. Okay. You, 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 say, you say something that um, I'm glad Lundue is, is, is on this live also because we've had the conversation around challenges in research. And on the beginning, very, very first video I posted about Young Researchers Hub was that um, I was still from a context of a Black person because that's the experience I know. And that's the experience I, I always want to speak from. I don't want to assume what's happening in other races. For us, my decision to do master's, honors, PhD, sometimes is not influenced because of my love for research, but sometimes because I'm not finding a job. Um, I don't want to sit at home. So I register for those masters and I need to find a topic. And most of the time you find yourself being influenced by your supervisor's area of expertise and interest simply because you had no grounding as a researcher as to, okay, I am doing this PhD, those masters or honors because I want to achieve A, B, C, and G. And because this is where I want to go, as you're saying, or because this is how I want to impact society. This is where I want Isa's voice to be heard. As a child, Yakutolo, this is our experiences as a people of Yakutolo. Uh, you understand? So that's some of the challenges that are there in research currently. Bana. We don't ask those questions you told, you're telling us about. Bana. What am I trying to achieve? in terms of my career, in terms of my impact and where I want to go in this whole academia space. And I also, the, uh, just lastly, before I go to another question, I also think that's also why we have a challenge when it comes to um, the, uh, the, I could say for a lack of a better word, inferiority when it comes to 
what is deemed as academia, academic voice. Um, because you don't know what you really want. Um, so you don't know how to structure your own voice. So you, you pick and choose on how other people's voices are and you try and want to find, oh, maybe if I speak this way, I'll be a respected academia. And I think for me personally, research should be about just telling what you're supposed to tell. It shouldn't be more about the words you use as long as coherent, as long as it's bringing facts, as as long as it's giving us solutions, I think that's what should matter more than what on, on how you're saying it. Of course, how you're saying it should people should understand, but most of the time we do research where even the people um, we want to talk to are like, "What are you talking about?" and "What are you saying?" So again, I think mm-hmm. the impo- it's important to understand the audience you want to talk to. When it comes to your research, that was my two cent edition. Um, um, second last question that we have is from Gazi. Um, Gazi is asking that please comment on your experience studying political science as a black woman um, around issues of mentoring and supervision, if any, any challenges on cementing yourself in the field. Okay, um, just to comment on what you were saying as well. Um, I think um, such research hubs are very important for young people because what I found myself in when I was doing my master's was there was no um, a support hub where I could go to in order to discuss such issues. A research for me during my master's was between myself and my supervisor, of course with support from friends to a point where Um, some of the issues that you face whilst doing your research are not issues you can speak about to your family because they wouldn't even understand anything that you're trying to explain. Um, um, Because the last time my parents um, remembered what I was doing at that time is because I was writing exams. So now that there are no exams, um, they won't understand where you ate and all that and all that. So I used to say to my parents, I'm writing a book. But it is very important um, what you're saying that the research that you're doing must be understood, especially for me in my case, by the people you used in your research. So if you've had participants that you were questioning or interviewing or observing, they must be able to read your document and understand what you're saying. In most cases, researchers write about people, tell stories of people, and then those people never even get to read those um, theses that they've written, nor even understand even though they read it. So my current supervisor in PhD told me that when writing, um, sometimes it's not the, the, the supervisor's influence that makes your writing that way. One, it is because you are writing for an, ex, an, an, an expert in the field, but not writing research to contribute to knowledge. So when you're writing to an expert to the field, you will use those words. You will speak about things, assuming that they will understand. In fact, you will come up with new other words that you have conceptualized yourself in link to what um, the, 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 the expert would have known already. But if you are writing to contribute to knowledge, you will define complicated words that you are still supposed to use. Because remember, um, there are so many things that come with the particular fields, theoretical frames that you must say as they are. But it is important to write for someone from the music discipline to read your thesis and understand so that even the marking process is easier. They find someone that is good in, 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 in your study field and then someone who understands the structure of your research. Another thing I was told when I was doing my master's is that we tend to complicate the process. The process is just to see that you are able to do research. You are not going to change the world with your master's thesis unless you publish from it. But the aim is not only to research something new, something that has never been researched before, but to show that you understand research, to learn how to do research. Because in many honors courses, such as politics, we do, the last time I checked, we didn't have a research course or whatever in order to teach you how to do research. We did have a research project that we submitted at the end of the year. But my first year in 2018, if I had a group like this, it would have been easier for me 
So the first year I had to go and read, what is a research aim? What is a research objective? How do those two link? How to create a golden thread in my discussion? And some of the things I've started to learn now in PhD on how to do them, uh, because um, I didn't have access to those. And you know, with time and having a limited um, timeline, I'm a person of timeline. So it was very difficult for me to read an entire article on how to conceptualize the research questions. And that has led to back and forth between me and my supervisor. To, to respond to Kazi's question, uh, doing politics as a Black woman for me at the time from undergrad to postgrad, um, 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 one of the things that I'm learning right now is that our stories, which are political in nature because everything is political, are only told at specific chapters and those chapters are always the closing chapters. You might know about that. So feminism, gender inequality, um, um, mm. intersectionality, those things are always taught at the end of the semester. And thus, even for me, it was it, it didn't come naturally for me to touch something that I'm passionate about, which is on gender studies when I was in politics. Important to note that in the structure, now there's recalculation and so on and so forth. But in the structure of the politics module and the discipline in itself, it is still Western in nature. Yes, we've seen some of the scholars trying to bring it in with uh, studies, for example, on modules that are being taught where there's mass fall movement that is being analyzed and so on and so forth. But when it comes to the theories, as a black woman, you're there as a student. You realize that actually, there are intersecting dynamics that I need to deal with whilst in this field when you are in postgrad level. Before then, you see yourself as just as a student who's trying to get means by so on and so forth. And um, uh, the relationship between the mentor and the supervisor is one tricky one. Uh, and, and, and it depends, there's something that Rhodes has taught me. Rhodes has a form and agreements where you sign both you and your supervisor on how to work together. I am willing to share that document where you engage with your supervisor on some of the things that will work when it comes to communication, turnaround time, deadlines, as well as how to be kind towards each other. I believe that the relationship has got so many um, dynamics underlying to it. You are a postgrad student with no funding, struggling with work because you have to balance those things and also ensuring that you finish on time because the faculty, the department is behind, um, is, is behind you in terms of submission. This is a supervisor struggling in their own personal aspect, academics, and also receiving the same pressure for you to submit your work. So the relationship must be a working relationship, not a personal one, a working relationship where critic is received and also critic is delivered kindly. And that needs the supervision um, relationship to be outlined at the beginning of the supervision process so that these kind of things are outlined from the beginning, including communication. I've seen some students struggling with turnaround time of receiving back uh, their research feedback or also the anxieties of receiving feedback. Now you'd have anxiety if you already know that the person that you're working with isn't kind, you've not set those ground rules and regulations, timelines, as well as support structures when it comes to your research. And that would impact the relationship between the mentor and the supervisor. For me, um, throughout my master's research, my supervisor was there. He was there throughout the times when I would have writer's block and decide not to write. He was there at the times where I had to resubmit and revise my master's thesis whilst I was eight months pregnant, he was there. So for me, that relationship was very important for me in terms of finishing it. But also, it is very important to choose who sit in your research table. There's something I've learned at the beginning of the year, which is a research table where you sit with your writers, where you sit with your literature, where you sit with your family, where you sit with your supervisor. Uh -huh. In that research table, you choose who to sit, you choose what to take. So in this discussion, there's so many things that will tell you on how to do research. You need to go back to your table, eliminate some of the things, eliminate some of the people, 
and choose who sits in your table and what role do they play in your table. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Asuke. I think we need to bring you back for just a research journey advice because wow, there's a lot to learn. <laughs> I'm like, research table, okay, what is that? What are we talking about? So I think we and Felicia we could talk and structure this conversation because um, again, there's still other session one to, to have in, in the younger researchers um, mm -hmm. equipping people. Um, we have two last questions for you and then we let you go. Um, there's one question from um, Bob Londiwe and her question is, conceptions of democratization make assumption about the universality of democracy. But we have seen, and you show us as city that this isn't the case. And so what are some of the ways we can think differently about democratization or, or the development of democracy? Um, and then I'm gonna rub it in with Musiswa's question. This is quite an interesting research. I just have a quick question. Considering the case of DRC, and its development from 2016 to 2018, how would you reimagine resilient institution and democracies in post-conflict society? Okay, um, um, just to answer perhaps um, one from Gogolondi, um, I, I do agree that um, democracy is not universal. And in order to understand that, there's something that I kept on writing about in my thesis, which my supervisor kept on um, scratching, which was Africanizing democracy. I know it's, a, it's, it's an illusion in itself. How do you Africanize democracy? For me, democracy must speak to the differences that these African states are currently faced with, and that has been faced with. In other countries, for example, Elections differ because of their ethnic lines. In South Africa, for example, they use social economic issues of young people in order to mobilize for elections. So how can South African, how can the South African state Africanize its democracy in order to speak to the issues that are faced by the country? Of course, still bearing in mind the internationalization or the global aspect that the country find it, finds itself in. That one is very difficult, Gogolundi, to be honest, because the, the, there's, there's a ticking box when it comes to democracy. And that ticking box, sort of like a checklist, was created by the West when they introduced democracy. Some of the things that they have, their accountability. Some of the things are elections. Some of the things are governance. And only two are being focused on which is governance and accountability. And the things that they name as a significant, as, as a significant factor to show governance, sorry, those things are not even evident or cannot be used in African states, such as the economic well-being. How can we put the economic well-being as a ticking point for good governance when the economic belonging of the African state is not in the African state in, in itself? So some of the things that um, um, in the, there's, there's something that, that um, it's also um, a freedom analysis that shows how free a country is or how, how authoritarian a country is. And when you see those checklists, they are unfair for so many African states. There are African states such as the DRC who only became democratic in the early 2000s, whereas the South Africa who became democratic in 1994, but still facing more or less similar issues, if not um, simpler issues than the DRC. So it's a difficult one to Africanize democracy and also still be in the same uh, playing level with the West because of those checklists that the West has used. And we all know what the West does when a country is not being democratic. I mean, we all know what the West could do if we would abolish or destroy elections as a significant factor to show democracy and start focusing on socioeconomic development without elections. So there is no way that they would actually say we are being anarchic in nature. And then there will be a lot of sanctions that will again affect um, 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 the people that we are trying uh, to serve in these changes. So yes, um, there was a question on, um, can you please- um, let, me just, let, me, let me just repeat the last question. 
Um, so Smusi Somaneli says, this is quite an interesting research. I just have a quick question. Considering the case of TRC and its development from 2016 to 2018, how would you reimagine resilient institutions and democracies in post-conflict societies? Okay. Okay, okay. Um, um, what's interesting about that question that I would like to start with is post-conflict. Um, whilst doing the research, um, there was something that I banked, which was uh, the contestations of what is deemed post, post-colonial states, post-conflict societies. And, and there's a lot that has been written currently about how we do not actually have post-colonial, but rather new co 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 colonial states. So we still have um, 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 conflict-ridden societies, even in the DRC, they're fighting about some, something else. Same applies as in universities, where if you fight about fees today, we'll fight about, um, we'll fight about accommodation next, and so on and so forth. But um, what was interesting in, in understanding these ethnic lines is that it never ends. The conflict is not only based on elections. So there's something that I wrote about in my thesis, which is pre-elections, during elections, and post-elections are conflict. And in post-elections are conflict, I argue the continuance of conflict because the conflict in itself isn't stemmed from the electoral system, but it started due to resources, the space of land, hence I spoke about the scramble of Africa, and then the system that did not respond to those two things, land and resources. I'm not sure if I, I, I responded correctly, but also it's Friday, it's Friday, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday. Um, I said, thank you very much. Um, you've equipped us today with a lot um, beyond just your research paper, but also you touch a lot on our on things that we can always go back and want to learn about in terms of research journeys. Um, and that's why I'm saying that there's still a lot of um, areas we want to touch on here on the Young Researchers Hub. We'll be touching on theoretical framework in a broader sense. Um, we'll have it um, on methodologies because the aim is to equip people as much as we can. Um, I know we're trying to do the best we can to people who are already faced with the challenge of research, um, but the aim is to also one day just equip those who are still and their undergrad so that by the time they get to here, they don't struggle as you're struggling. Um, but from us, the Young Researchers Hub, we are thankful for your time. And I'm thankful to everyone who have um, watched this live, asked the questions. And I know it's a Friday, but hey, we're soldiers. Uh, as black people, we don't have the time to get tired. Tiredness is a luxury. Ours is to continue just fighting. And so even on a Friday day, you fight and you go out and be on the streets and come back on Saturday like, what happened yesterday? I remember seeing the other time a person um, in a club and they just in the middle of the club and they think about colonialism and this and this and that. And because That's those are our time. realities that, <laughs> that um, as you mentioned, that our lives are political. And um, <laughs> I remember one time having a conversation with a friend and as, as I mentioned that everything for me, I look at it from the lens of a black person because that's the experience I have. And then they introduced me to critical race theory. And because I was asking, why am I continuously looking things at this way? And they're like, please read critical race theory. And then I've got to understand as to how it got here. Um, but here from us, the Young Researchers Hub, we ask you to sanitize social distance. Those who, um, who want to vaccine, please do so. Those who have not decided, please do your research and decide. Um, let's keep it safe and let's make sure everyone is safe. Um, there's still a long battle for African people. We need all your minds. We need you all safe, healthy, um, back in your fit. Um, just after this pandemic is over, we need to research its impact to us and how it's, it has stagnated our progress as a black people. Um, we're already behind in a lot of things, and this is another setback for us. So please don't be reckless in whatever that you do. Have fun, but at the same time, be responsible. From us, Young Research Hub, will do at home. From us, Young Research Hub, we love our people. We love anything that has to find solutions to our people. So we'll continue having those sessions. 
And from me, your host, I love you so much. And I want the best for you. And I want everyone to love research, to love writing and contribute to the African continent. From us, goodbye and have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.